And uh, I would like to welcome all of you who are uh, logged in today. This is actually the 37th in a series of Zoom lectures sponsored by Congregation KINS. And I think by now, all of you are aware that the speakers focus on a STEM topic and a correlation with Torah. Our speaker today, uh, this is a repeat performance for him, is Dr. William Gewertz. Uh, he spoke a couple of months ago. And uh, this topic today is very interesting. Many of us in the past have heard a presentation about the international dateline, but we're going to get a little bit of a different perspective today as his topic is, is a dateline a logical necessity, a halachic view. Uh, Dr. Gewirt studied with Rav Aaron Lichtenstein Zetzal and the Rav Zetzal, received a PhD degree in mathematical logic that's the first time in my life I ever heard anybody have a degree in that, from the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences in 1974. He joined Bell Labs in 1977 and eventually became the chief technical officer of AT&T Business. Currently, he is a consultant in the field of networking, communications technology, and associated services. He has a very strong interest in halakhic areas, that have to do with math and science, logic. He uh, has given presentations on Zamanim, the Jewish calendar, the halakhic dateline, and other related topics. And so uh, I don't want to burden you with any more information, but we'll go ahead and get started. I'll turn the program over to Dr. Gewertz, but I will remind you that as always, you are welcome to interrupt him and ask questions at any point in time. Thank you. Thank you very much. For those of you who were here last time, we're going to very briefly touch on uh, a brisa going back uh, to Kiddush HaChodesh. Interestingly, it is the single Talmudic source that makes its way into the study of the dateline, at least according to, you know, the Chazonish. But let's start, uh, let's start with the beginning. Uh, if you ask an average Talmud Chacham who is into the study of the dateline, there is, uh, those of you who have uh, a little more than one hour, there is a three volume set on the dateline that was published recently uh, by someone I spoke to. Uh, I think his last name is, is Rabbi Kuber. Uh, we obviously do not agree about it, many things, but nonetheless, his book is well worth reading if you really like this topic. If you ask most people, is the dateline a logical necessity? And I mean, I mean this in the strict logical sense. Do you have to have a dateline? Must there be a dateline? Most will answer that you can't proceed without a dateline existing somewhere. The only question is where? Of course, if there has to be a, a dateline, then you could argue then there must be a dateline in halacha as well, because the halacha has to deal with, if it's logically mandated, the halacha would have to deal with that. Now, it turns out, uh, we're going to argue very strongly uh, that there is no halacha necessity for a dateline, uh, despite the fact that it would appear to be necessary, so we'll get to that. The interesting to me uh, is that the first reference that I know of, uh, and I've asked others who are not necessarily Jewish or interested in the halacha, if they can point to the earliest references to a dateline in general literature. And most of the two that come up most prominently, one by an Arab uh, geographer uh, living at the end of the 13th century and the other by a French philosopher roughly the same time, both come about 50 years or so or more after the first reference to a dateline actually in halacha. Surprisingly, uh, the one who's quoted always is uh, Zerachia Halevi, better known as the Balhamar. He quotes the existence of what seems to be a dateline. I say seems to be, uh, it's not clear 
that he means a line in the, like in the, he may mean a point, he may mean a place, uh, but let's assume, give him the benefit of the doubt. He refer, he's referring to a date line. And also earlier than him, surprisingly, in the Kuzari by Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, there is also a notion of a date line. Uh, and he discusses it with respect to Shabbat. Where is Shabbat? And the basis that they draw on uh, for the existence of a date line is the Gemara that we talked about last time in Rosh Hashanah. Now, last time we very, you know, simply assumed that we are talking about what I called last time the average mola, the average amount of time between the beginning of two lunar months. Uh, last time we said that lunar months do not have the same length. Now, I assume without proof, but based on you know, just analysis and based on the knowledge that Chazal had, that Chazal in the times of the Gemara had information or the information was certainly available to them that the length of a lunar month was variable. We talked about it being basically varying over a period of almost 18 hours. But they came up with this notion of an average lunation. And the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says that if the new moon appears before 12 noon, and remember 12 noon for the 18 hours from the yeah, you know, the assumed beginning of the day in when it comes to Rosh Chodesh, the beginning of the day is set to 6 p.m. So from 6 p.m. On, on day one to 18 hours later, which is 12 p.m. on day two, if you see a new moon, that day can be declared Rosh Chodesh. If it's seen after 12 o'clock, the next day is Rosh Chodesh comes along the Balamor, and the Balamor would seem to say that the reason for that has to do with a date line, arguing as follows. And this is very important to understand his basis. His basis was the following. When it turns 12 noon, the place where the date line is, is 18 hours on the far side of Yerushalayim. So if you go 18 hours ahead of Jerusalem, to Europe, to the Far East, I mean, to North America, and all the way back to the Far East, if you, or if you go nine hours the other way, the, I'm, I'm sorry, six hours the other way. So six hours back from Eris Israel, that's the day one. And if the day in, Eretz Yisrael is past 12 o'clock, then it's past six o'clock at the date line. So it's already the next day. On the other hand, if it's before 12 o'clock and you go six hours back from Eretz Yisrael, you're going to have a complete 24 hour day. And the Balmar argues that in order for a day to be Rosh Chodesh or you, it has to have somewhere on earth the possibility of a 24-hour day. And this is roughly the argument of the Balamor. The Balamor is very lengthy. Uh, if you can, reading it inside is very well worth doing. But that's the argument of the Balamor. This argument stayed buried in a parish on Rosh Hashanah without anyone drawing much consequence to the thing. However, in the 19th century, you had railroads, you had people beginning to travel. You didn't have an airplane yet, but you had railroads and people began to travel. And they certainly began to travel across Russia to the east, to the easternmost parts of Russia and reached the Bering Straits. Some of them crossed over into Alaska, 
There were Jews in Alaska in the 18th century. And of course, these people wrote back to rabbis in standard Europe, asking them about a dateline because there was a dateline established in the secular world, which we will talk about. It was drawn somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean uh, between the Philippines and Hawaii. So they wanted to know where is the Jewish halachic date? Uh, the history of all the people who responded to that Shaila uh, is not really complete. I don't know everyone, uh, nor have I tried to find every tshuva, though I don't think there are many in existence. God knows somebody will do a PhD thesis and find a few more sources uh, for what's going on. But for the most part, uh, the, the first shuva that I know about is from the rabbi of a town called Razin. Uh, uh, his name was Ramosha Lapidus. Uh, I know him only uh, as when he died, uh, his rabbinus was taken over by the rab, Rav Soloveitchik's father, Ramosha Soloveitchik, became the Rav of Reisen in 1901 when Rav Moshe Lapidus died at a very relatively old age. He, like the Chazonish, who became famous for this psaac about 60 years later, had argued at some point in the latter half of the 19th century that the Balhamar creates an exact point where the date line exists and that point is, of course, 90 degrees to the east of Jerusalem. And he didn't have any of the Malamors, I'm, I'm sorry, of the Chazonish's sophisticated machinations. He basically drew a straight line. Draw a straight line, 90 degrees to the east of Yerushalayim, goes straight down the continent of Asia through Australia, and you can spend your Shabbos moving from side to side. You know, Shabbos starts on one side of the date line. If you don't like Shabbos that much, walk to the other side of the date line, and it's Sunday. You want lunch? Walk to the other side and have a Shabbos lunch with your friends. He believed in a rigorous line that exists just like the Balamar. Like, just like he assumed the Balhamar meant. Now, whether he realized that the Balhamar was not talking about the real Molot, and this was just a artificial Molot created by the Romans and adapted by the rabbis, I don't know. I really have no idea. I can't tell what he really believed the situation, nor do I know whether the Balhamar was aware of it. The Balamar was certainly aware of a date line. My suspicion is the Balamar lived in Provence. Provence was one city that unquestionably was modern Orthodox. When the rush escaping from the pogroms and the crusades where his classmate, the Mordechai was killed and his rabbi, of Mayor of Rutenberg was in prison for all of his life. The Rush was the first person who traveled to every Mokom Torah in Europe. The first place he arrived was Provence. And the Rush arrives in Provence and he is flabbergasted. He is a nice, you know, member of the German Orthodox community, which back then, well before Shamshin of Hirsch, was as backward in a Torah-only philosophy as you could imagine. It was the most Haredi part of Judaism. So he grew up there, comes to Provence, and finds people who are aware of philosophy, astronomy, from doctors, and he is overwhelmed. And he writes so. He leaves three years later 
also writing that he really wonders whether these people are really orthodox. So if you think the doubts about modern orthodoxy is a modern phenomenon, it stretches back to the rush. The Balamor grew up and spent his entire life in Provence. And it is undoubtedly that he was aware of currents in astronomy and scientific thinking. And it's not inconceivable that he read his views into the Talmud. Uh, whether that's really what happened or he meant, he understood what was going on, that's beyond my pay grade. But I raise that because you, it's not entirely clear that his sources uh, were a Gemara that was aware of a date line. It's not clear at all that the Gemara thought about a date line. It's primarily the case that the vast majority of Sugyot throughout Shas do not think of a round earth. And if there's not a round earth, the need of a date line is completely unnecessary. There's one end and there's the other end. And what happens behind this end and around the other end, how they get connected, how you go from one to the other, those are things that are discussed in the Gemara without even any inkling that the surface is actually a sphere. So I don't really know uh, whether this whole approach of the Balamar makes the greatest amount of sense, but again, great rabbis, the, uh, uh, you know, Ramosha Lapidus, and of course the Chazonish, and a few others afterwards were of that opinion. Okay. Around that time, uh, in the non-Jewish world, uh, there were many other people uh, who talked about the only Jewish source that is uh, people quote. Uh, there is a Yerushalmi that could possibly be referring to a day. Remember, the Yerushalmi was written in Eretz Yisrael where the knowledge of Roman science was a little bit greater. And there were people in Roman science uh, that thought the world was round. So it's very possible there might be a single reference in the original. The more definitive reference is in the Kuzari. The problem with that is that most people will deny that the Kuzari was written before the 14th century. And by the 14th century, there's no great finish that people were aware of around the earth. Nonetheless, in the end of the 1200s or the 13th century, a real description of the paradox of a date line appeared in secular literature, both in the Middle East by a Muslim philosopher, a, a geographer, as well as uh, Nikolai or Eresma, a European geographer. And what they said, and I'll tell you the one from the European because the cities will be no rememberable to you and to me. So they said one sets out and hypothetically from the South of France and the two people traveling uh, surprisingly, not surprisingly at all, were named Socrates and Aristotle. So Socrates and Aristotle go for a trip around the world. And little did they know, they didn't know about what was around the world, but they assumed the world was round. And he said, Socrates travels going, you know, go west, young man. So and that should be then, oh, well, let's make him Aristotle. He was younger. So the young man goes west. Aristotle <laughs> begins traveling. He crosses the Atlantic, he crosses North America, he crosses the Pacific, he ends up in Asia, gets all the way back to Southern Europe. On the other hand, Socrates, the old man, he goes east. So he goes to the Middle East, he goes to Asia, crosses the Pacific, crosses North America, crosses back and arrives back in the southern, in the southern France. And because they're going at the same pace, they arrive on the same day. Now, 
uh, Aristotle says to everybody that he was going going in the you know the, the in the western direction. He says when he comes back, oh, today is Tuesday. Of course, the people living in the south of France say no, it's not. Today is Wednesday, and to which. Uh, to which Socrates responds, no, today is Thursday, which is exactly what would happen uh, were this story to be real. And so let me simplify it. Uh, we're not gonna do the mathematics, but the speed at which you do this, as long as you don't exceed the speed of the Earth's rotation, let's assume you had a plane uh, not too far in the future, that could move, in fact, we had one called the Concorde, that could move uh, at, the, the rota at the speed of our rotation. So you have two babies, one baby, you know, let's take it to New York or Chicago for that matter. Let's go to Chicago. And these two planes take off on a Tuesday afternoon at 12 noon from O'Hare, one going towards Europe and the other one going towards Seattle and they circumnavigate and literally the people sitting in the plane looking out the window see the sun, it go, the ones going to the west are watching the sun directly in the same place they travel around the earth, okay? So they come back to Chicago and they never saw the sunset. So what do they think? Oh my God. I, I was just traveling on my watch for 24 hours. I'm back in Chicago. It's 12 noon. I guess it's still Tuesday. The people flying the east, as soon as they go for three hours, it turns dark. They go another, they go another six hours, it turns light. Another six hours, it turns dark again. So when they get back to Chicago, they saw the sun set twice. They say, huh, I left on Tuesday, the sun set twice, it must be Thursday. And this is exactly what happened to Aristotle and to Socrates as they travel. You go in the Western direction, what happens? As much as you move, the day is getting slightly longer because you're moving in the direction that the sun is moving. So you add up all the shtiklach of day that you transpired, you're gonna come up with a full day. Going the other direction, as any of you know, if you fly to Los Angeles, you gain time. You fly to Israel, you lose time. So the travelers back in the days of the 13th century experienced exactly that. So when they arrive back in Europe, they're experiencing what they think of as the next day and the day after. Now, th that's obviously true, but for those who want you know, an experiment, well, that experiment was actually had by uh, Magellan. Magellan went west and circumnavigated the entire world. Since his boat wouldn't go on dry land, he had to travel south of South America, he had to go around Africa, but he made his way back to Europe. And now since he was going in a westerly direction, he never, never made it. Uh, he got involved in a little war battle somewhere around the Philippines and he was killed. But his ship made it back to a little known historical fact. On his ship was somebody who's had a full-time job of recording the day. And of course, since he traveled west, it was one day later. So when he comes back to Europe, he verified that coming back, he had come, he arrived one, what he thought was one day later. So we had verification that the person going over the date line in this direction would add a day uh, because if he circumnavigated the globe, the guy going in the other direction would take that. So the question is, all right, so what that requires is an explanation. And I just gave you an explanation. 
The days get longer in one direction. The days get shorter in the other direction. So obviously, someone counting sunsets is going to get confused. And from a logical perspective, that is really the end of the story. You know, there's no reason to argue with either of them. You can simply tell them, you know, he, we here did not travel around the world. We were just always here. And we counted in our number of sunsets. And if you want to reintegrate in our society and use our calendar, it would be a good idea for you to forget your stupid idea as to what day of the week it is and what you know day of the year it is and come back to the norm normal count of the calendar that all of us are keeping the people who weren't traveling in one direction. Okay. This, is, uh, this is, you know, the way you might think about it uh, logically. Now, you could also use what is done today. Today, we established the date line. We put one in the middle of the Atlantic, ostensibly far from everybody, but you know there are people everywhere. In fact, we changed our mind a couple of years ago. We moved American Samoa to one side or the other. And as a result, we have this quote unquote international date line and associated with it, there is the law of the international date line. If you pass the date line going in a westerly direction, in other words, where the days, you know, you see one less sunset, you went all around the earth, you add a day. You pass the date line in the opposite direction, you subtract it. That's the international day. Then the question becomes, right, is there a Jewish date line? Is there a need for a Jewish date line? Now, I have just, you know, I will get back to the argument again with another couple of examples, but many, many people, this Shiloh really came up in the Second World War. In the Second World War, as you know, the Mir Yeshiva, which was not entirely Litvish, the Mir Yeshiva had a large contingent of Ger Hasidim. Those of you who know the history of Ger, many of the Ger Rabbanim, like Lubavitch, uh, were huge Talmidei Chachamim. They really, in other words, it's not like today, they just have the right bloodline. Uh, Ger Hasidim were ruled by many, many Talmidei Chachamim, as was the case in much, most of the time. I'm, I would almost, well, I'm not going to say almost always. Uh, I said almost always the time in the, in the case of Lubavitch. So in Mir were many Ger Hasidim. So the Ger Hasidim, they weren't going to send Shilas uh, to the Chazonish. They sent Shilas to the Ger Rebbe. Now, the Ger Rebbe knew his limitations. So he, for some strange reason, I don't know the history again. It would be wonderful if a real history of this were written. Uh, you know, I do have parts of the documentary history. I have the letters uh, between a professor at the Hebrew University at the time and Rav Herzog that I received from that professor's great grandson. It's a family heirloom and they Xerox them. And I read them on 90 pages of back and forth letters. But we don't, I don't know it much about the Gera Rebbe. I do know one thing. He decided this Shiloh is well beyond him. So he consulted with another person of intense interest uh, who has been forgotten. Uh, he's been forgotten from all worlds. His name is Rav David Shapiro, a genius beyond genius. Uh, he is as far as he wrote uh, early in his life, uh, had Haskamas from uh, anti-Zionists of the highest order uh, to Rav Cook. He got smicha at a very young age uh, by I forgot who, uh, I'll remember, I don't remember his name, someone who considered the Satmar Rebbe at the time a Zionist. You're talking about a Rebbe well entrenched in what we might call today the Eid Achareta. And then he, when he moved to Eretz Israel, he became a chassid of Rav Kook and taught at Rav Kook's yeshiva. His first sefer had a from everybody, 
including the Chazonish, Mordechai Meiser, then he became known as a proto-Zionist. The Gera Rebbe still had tremendous respect for him. So Rav David Shapiro got a copy of the Shaila, as did the Chazonish, as did the entire rabbinate of the city of Yerushalayim. Yoshev Rosh at the time was Rav Svi Pesach Frank, who sent the Shaila to Rav Herzog. Uh, the great Rosh Hashiva at the time was Rav Aaron Kotler's father-in-law, Rav Yisra Zalman Meltzer. They were all involved in this Shaila. So the greatest, you know, person at the time in the calendar was Rabbi Chil Mikhail Tukachinsky, who was a Zionist. He wrote a sefer towards the end of his life. He, uh, for those, I just, personal note, every heir of Yom Kippur, uh, I read his son's biography describing the last few days of Rabbi Chil Mikhail Tukachinsky's life. Uh, if every, anyone wants to be inspired about how a from Jew faces death, he wrote a safer, a two volume safer on death, uh, in, uh, on, the, on dying. You know, on, uh, so, and he also wrote uh, the safer, uh, you know, Yush, uh, what he called, about the city of Yerushalayim. He wrote a safer, he wrote many swarm on diverse topics. He was the expert in Zmani. And he said that the date line is 180 degrees from Yerushalayim and base that on various Midrashic sources, very strongly opposed to the Chazonish. Rav David Shapiro using a brilliant use of a Medrash, which I believe was also referenced the Halacha much earlier uh, by Rav Mordechai Yafi, a, a slightly younger than the Ramah, responsible for writing the Sefer Halacha called Seder Levushim. He also made reference to this Midrash. They mysteriously, not going to go into how, uh, that mid, based on that Midrash, they said that the international date line, first he said 135 degrees, then he said 142 degrees, but some. Now, the advantage of going 142 degrees from Yerushalayim is your two degrees from the International Day Line, which caused significant problems in Yerushalayim because people thought that he was cheating. He wanted to use the International Day Line and give it a Jewish rationale. But nonetheless, those were the three major, major, major postkim who decided it, the, the real question was, what should we do, Yom Kippur? Shabbos, people were machmir from Alacha the Orisa for two days. Now, the problem really came up before they all ended up in Shanghai. They were for some period of time in Kobe, Japan. And the Chazanish was of the opinion that the 90 degree shita conforms to a landmass. While it's 90 degrees. But if you go on the same landmass uh, in the eastern direction, you're part of the Yerushalayim date. So going east, he was Matir Shanghai completely. So Shanghai basically was okay l'chol The problem was Kobe. Two, Rav Tukachinsky and Rav David Shapiro said, keep, uh, keep, Yom Kippur and Kobe as the people in Kobe, while the Chazonish very dramatically told them not to do that. Eat on the day they think is Yom Kippur. Literally, he wrote that. Eat on the fourth, fast on the fifth. As it turned out, uh, you know, as it turned out that way. So now let's, there were two people at the time Rav Tzvi Frank and Rav Yisra Zalman Meltzer joined after the war by, you know, people, I would argue, not as well known or as prominent. Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank uh, was a posake of the highest order. Rav Yisra Zalman Meltzer 
was a Rosh Hashiva of the highest order. So Rav Zalman Meltzer, in fact, they found letters now between him and the Chazonish on this topic. Again, something that does not make the whole world happy. They, they, some people say the letters are forgery. Some people say whatever. But uh, given on who found them and who testifies to their, uh, to their accuracy, I was present uh, when those letters were first presented just by accident. I was in Yerushalayim and I was invited uh, by Ravuri Dasberg, Zechasarek with Racha, who died of a massive heart attack, killing many, a few other people who were with him in a car that drove off the cliff. But he invited me uh, to a shear by, uh, by uh, Rav Tzvi Karen that was attended by two children uh, uh, um, of the Rosh Shiva of Mir, who was in Kobe at the time, uh, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, Shlomo Zalman's uh, uh, son-in-law, uh, Rav Zalman Nechemi Goldberg. It was a very interesting shear. And he described the following letter. I'll just tell you one of the letters. So Mr. Zalman says to Chazonish, why the heck are, you know, I didn't use that word. Are we getting involved in this kind of a shayla? You remember your shita was the shita of, of uh, Rabbi Shalapidus. And if you look in the shayla meshiv, the shayla meshiv was in the world of the 19th century as great a pose as Rabbi Yitzchol Chanan. So if you say the Shaila Meshiv, or you say Rav Shloim or you say the, you know, or you say Rav Yitzchol Chanan, to anyone living in Europe in the 19th century, it's like saying God said on Mount Sinai, this is what you have to do. And he said, why are we arguing? The Shaila Meshiv, Haskin, like Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank, why are we getting involved in a machlokas that one of the greatest posts of the 19th century already decided? Now, what was interesting is Rav Shmulevitz's, uh, who was, you know, was in the Chaim Shmulevitz's sons who were in the room. I don't know which one it was. I can't tell them apart. I don't know whether it's the one in the mirror or the one who was the Rosh Hashiva uh, in, uh, in Haifa. One of them died. I don't know which one. He said, I remember this, it was like, you know, it was in Hebrew and Rav Dasper was sitting next to me and I would turn to him occasionally to translate for me because their Hebrew was a little bit better than my understanding of Hebrew. One of them said, you mean the Chazon issue would be, would, would have respect for the Shoel Meshur or Shoel Aintonson? He didn't have respect for the Chazam Sofa. To which Rav Zalman Nechemia Goldberg also Nebuchadnezzar Nifter, turns to him and says, you don't know very much about lit, lit, Litvax. He said, to a Litvak, the Chassam Sofer was a, was a Rosh Hashiva. To a, you know, to a, but to a Litvak, the Shoah Meshev was a Poshik Mufak. Okay, anyway, enough for the stories. So they basically said, they basically said as follows, the world is an Eretz Yisrael. If I go from Eretz Yisrael in one direction, I keep walking, it's the same day as I walk. If I go the other direction, I keep walking, it's the same day. You go around the world. If the two people meet, they ask a shayla. Never happened. If they don't meet, you keep Shabbos the day where the people came from. So they said, where do you think the people in Japan came from? They come from going through Europe, North America is on their way to the Japan, or did they get there going through Europe? They got there going through Europe. Same thing with, with, uh, same thing with, with uh, Australia, same thing with, with New Zealand, same thing with the Philippines. On the other hand, you know, the other side, the other way. So we don't have a date line. We just establish the day based on where we are relative, relative to Eris Israel which sounds like an extremely reasonable point of view. Now, in order to sort of make uh, this minagamokam, as they said, now, there are issues with the minagamokam. The biggest issue with the minagamokam, uh, one that you have to answer 
Uh, but again, fortunately, uh, we don't have any record of the Shiloh ever being asked. It would, be, it would have been a great Shiloh. There was, you know, there are no Jews as far as I know in American Samoa. There was a Jewish community in Anchorage when the Seward Purchase took place, when we made the best purchase from Russia ever, buying Alaska for $7 million. Now, Alaska was part of the Soviet Union. And guess what? Alaska was keeping time with the Soviet Union. So in Alaska today, in Soviet times, would have been Tuesday. You know, on the other hand, after the purchase, it was now owned by the Americans, who among other things, changed the calendar by 11 days. That's a topic for a different day. Uh, they went from the Gregorian calendar to our, you know, I'm sorry, from the Julian calendar which the Russians keep Arayomazeh, which is why their Kratzmach is different than ours. They went to the Gregorian calendar, which Pope Gregory uh, instituted. Uh, we never had a Pope Gregory. So we're still, we still have the problems that we follow the Julian calendar on a couple of halachas. People, we call that the Kufos of Shmuel. The Kufos of Shmuel, uh, to let you know, is better known in the rest of the world as the Julian calendar. Again, a topic for a very different day. So the day of Shabbos changed. What would have been Shabbos this week became Friday. And had there been Jews there at the time, and I assume there were, they must have had a problem. Fortunately, the Jewish trappers from, they were in the fur business. Those of you know, the largest fur uh, furrier in existence today is an Orthodox great, great grandson. Uh, and if any of you travel to Anchorage and you go to Green's Furrier, uh, he is from his wife. His wife's father was my daughter's teacher uh, in Bruria High School. So anyway, his father came after there. He didn't, he did, he was not, he, he came to Alaska. So there was never a Shiloh. So when the Jews all left, the memory of what day of the year it was, what day of the week it was, disappeared as well. When Jews returned, it was already on the American side. There's a little bit of complexity around places like Alaska. If there were Jews there, there would be complexity as well about American Samoa today. What happens when you change the date? Now, let me give you a different uh, way of looking at this that will, it's not, it's not 100%, you know, kosher LP logic, but it's very kosher uh, LP sphero. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, what you would say is suggestive. And I think it, it approximates being correct logic. I traveled a lot in my life. Uh, I, you know, I used to commute to London. Uh, I travel to San Francisco at least once a month, sometimes twice a month. Uh, I said Kaddish for my father in 20 international cities. But I was constantly on the move. I crossed state lines of Heen, date lines of hair, you know, and people ask me, you know, did you change your clock? I said, never. I said, in fact, I kept my New York calendar because all my appointments were written down in my calendar. So if I wanted to know what time to take, get up for a call or take a call or go to a meeting, whether regardless of where I was in the world, the day was the day it was in New York and I would adjust to the Minagamaka. So I had to go to a meeting two o'clock. In Japan, it would say two o'clock Monday in New York. And I would know what to do. I said, more often than not, I wouldn't change my clock either because everything was written down in times of New York time and I would adjust. So I said to someone, you know, if I go to Chicago uh, from, or I go to Seattle, or I go to San Francisco, it's three hours earlier. Is it a mitzvah de Arisa that I have to change my watch? And people look at me like, I don't think it's a mitzvah. I'm not even sure it's a secular law. Forget a mitzvah. 
There's absolutely no reason. As long as you're comfortable, as long as most of your meetings are with people in New York, I really don't know if you can't keep New York going. So I say, well, if that's the case, and most of my meetings are still in New York or London, why would I go to Japan? Do I have to change the date so I get confused? Let me keep the, you know, I'm in London, I'm in Japan for three meetings. All right, so three times over two or three days, it might get slightly confused. I have 17 other meetings over, phone, over the phone. In those days, we didn't have Zoom yet. Uh, you know, I, you know, that I have to meet a schedule either in London or New York or Seattle. So I'm gonna be confused enough based on time zones. So I have to get doubly confused based on what day of the week it is. So, you know, keeping the right day of the week is really a question of where you feel your affiliation is. And the halacha articulated by Rasulius Frank and Revisor Zalman Meltzer, afterwards by an, um, the, the, uh, the Wiener Rav also agreed with this. There are a few other people who, you know, of lesser, you know, lesser stature uh, or lesser, less known. Uh, they, they said, so I said to myself, you know, their logic was, you're going from Yerushalayim. So if you feel affinity from Yerushalayim, that you're to the west of Yerushalayim, then you keep time with Yerushalayim. If you're going to the east, as far as you, you know, if you're, you know, depending on where you are, you don't have to keep any artificial date because somebody told you, you know, if you're from Yerushalayim and you're sitting wherever you want, you can keep affinity with Yerushalayim. And the, their view is that that was halachically correct, that a person going east from Yerushalayim should continue keeping Yerushalayim time. Person going west to do the same, and there's no deadline. Now, go one step further. Uh, I'll tell you the real problem, the killer. What do you do in Antarctica? The Antarctica, Mamish goes around the earth. So you have people in Antarctica who arrived from Australia. We have people who arrived from South America. We have people who arrived from Russia. We have people who arrived from India. What do they do? Do they ask a Shaila? And do you, you know, you have the dateline in theory goes through Antarctica. Do they walk around and as they cross the dateline drive themselves crazy? Of course not. Every colony in Antarctica keeps time with the country they came from. Their affinity is not to some artificial line drawn by some you know, people sitting in Greenwich, England. Their affinity is to where they're from. Mamish, nobody goes crazy. If they have to have a meeting, they write down the meeting in with two places. And as a result of writing down the meeting, Nobody gets confused. So that in brief uh, is motivation uh, for the sock of people who really, really were attacked uh, and attacked very strongly. The person whose main I didn't mention who bore the brunt of this attack was Rav Menachem Kasher. I can't, I, when I wrote about this in a journal, the letters to the editor, to me, were offensive to the hilt. People accused me of every crime known to man, being influenced by Rav Menachem Kasher, who really didn't argue this at all, but he had a sheet uh, similar to this. And everyone claimed that everything Rav Menachem Kasher said, that was not dissimilar to what I just said, was Sheker, it was just an attack on the Chazonish, he was a chakran. So here's a guy, you know, those of you who know who he was, wrote, you know, you know, wrote the most comprehensive parish midrash on Chumash in the history of the world before the age of computers, and is used to this day as if you want to see all midrash on Chumash, you pick up Torah Shlema. So he was accused of saying something similar, but and there were a few others. 
but I'm not, you know, I don't have, I'll, I'll mention of Kasher because he's the one who bears most of the reviews. I write an article, it's gone the next year. Uh, so, you know, I can deal with a couple of days of abuse. But if any of you go around talking about this, uh, I assure you, you're going to find people who are going to want to abuse you. Even though, even though, Yidoli HaPoskim today, Yidoli HaPoskim, we're not talking about, you know, current Poskim. We're talking about Reb Maisha, we're talking about Roshon Mizam and Arbachit, I think Rabbi Yashiv also, I believe all of them now, Askin Lahalacha, like Ruth Hesach Frank, I may be mistaken about that, but a number of Yidoli HaPoskim of the last generation did not Poskim like the Chazonish. The place where surprisingly, the Chazonish is strongest, and it really drives me crazy. And I've mentioned this uh, to the two Rashi Yeshiva, Rav Shachter and Rav Willig, who are two of you know, the senior Rashi Yeshiva at YU, are crazed with the opinion of the Chazonish. And you know, I cannot move them off that position. I'm going to try again. Uh, whenever I get the chance, you know, mostly if either of them you know, is in the same place as I for Shabbos. I tried to sit with them and talk about it again. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of their sons-in-law, I won't mention, said, you know, I don't think you should talk to my father-in-law again about this. He's not really enjoying it. But anyway, except for two Ayu Rosh Shiva, and of course, the vast majority of the Haredi world, what I just told you should not be repeated. Uh, they are strong believers in the Chazonish. So let me stop there. Uh, anyone with any questions? Uh, you've been very silent uh, for almost an hour, and uh, I apologize. That's okay. We're doing fine. Any questions from anyone? One question. So, uh, Dr. Gord, so in, in the Antarctica example, what happens when, if I'm keeping, I don't know, Chicago time, and that the, what's on my watch conflicts with the metzius of where I am in terms of sunrise and sunset. Right, right, so right, right. Are you going to dive in shachars at two o'clock in the morning? No. 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 no you're going to change your watch. Uh, in other words, your watch is always determined by sunrise and sunset, alamuda shachar, alota shachar, where you are. That's clear. The, halacha, you know, the place where this became relevant was the people who went on tour. Uh, there was a tour who went off the coast of, of Antarctica. I don't know, those of you, uh, another little factoid. Uh, my first cousin, I have four first cousins, Nebuch, after the Second World War. Everyone else, unfortunately, Hitler took care of. Uh, their parents, and, you know. But one of my first cousins' daughter is married to Dan Steeles, uh, otherwise known as Dan Aleph. Uh, and he sponsored a tour to Antarctica. And he had many, many shilas uh, about Shabbos and davening and everything else. In terms of Shabbos, this is off my topic. This is really a halachic topic. Uh, I, what I just described to you is what day of the week it is. What you should do halachically, you have to ask a post. So often, you know, when these shilas come up, I will call an honest to goodness pose. Make sure he understands what's going on scientifically or astronomically. And then given, make, once he knows all the facts, I'll let him pass. But if you're going to, Alaska, to uh, Antarctica and you travel however you travel and you never stop anywhere, you know, well, you, know you keep the day of Shabbos of the last place you were. And that's it. If you never made it to, if you made it to Antarctica and you were on a Yishu with Jews, I don't think there is any, and they kept Shabbos a different day, you would follow that day. Now that shock goes back to the Rav Salveh. Uh, and in fact, uh, he had a slight chumr on that shock, which he eventually uh, was able, was, did not, he told someone not to keep his chumr because a chaplain was traveling between Hawaii and Guam, and there were Jews on Guam. So he, he told him that he has to keep Shabbos according to the Minigamakum, which of course Guam, Hawaii, 
changes the minute I'm up them. And then he said, the first week you're there, the first time, you know, you go from Hawaii to Guam, you have to keep Shabbos both ways. And the guy said, I go back and forth more than once a week. So he says, keep Shabbos wherever you are. So if you don't make it to another Yishuv, you keep Shabbos like, like the place you were. And that gets into the whole area of Hayekam Svira and Yidavin, Yidavin twice the same day. I uh, once uh, was in uh, Japan and I left Japan on a Serb, on, uh, on uh, what is Tainas Esther. And I had the most fun on the plane because there were people on the plane who had come from Hong Kong, stopped in uh, Narita to take a flight back to New York. So I was joking with them, is they're gonna have to dive in Shachar's Minchamayruf during the time we pass through, you know, if we get to a Northern place on the flight back, we're gonna pass through Shachar's Minchamayruf in about a half hour. I said to them, you know, you should stay up and do that. I promise you I'll be asleep, <laughs> which I always, I always make sure I'm asleep because I don't want to have shyless as to whether I'm supposed to dap and mm -hmm. see a sunrise and sunset yeah. going, you know, at some point. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's, it, the traveling oh, shy is a very different job. You only, you know, the Babich Rabbi had weird, weird, weird um, in hugging about that that are still kept to this day in the Babich. Yeah, it, it seems to be a very controversial topic, um, and everybody has a different opinion on it. Thank you so much. We appreciate the time you took to prepare to give such an interesting presentation. And for all of you who are logged in today, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I have to make a special announcement. I, I truly regret having to do this. It really saddens me. Even though the feedback we've been receiving about the STEM lecture series has all been good, and I am personally interested in keeping the series going. Unfortunately, the frequency is going to be decreasing to more like one or two times per month rather than weekly. This is due primarily to the difficulty in securing new speakers, the desire not to burden the same speakers over and over and over again, and also the fact that as work patterns are returning to normal, fewer people are even available to attend lectures at noon on a, on a work day. To all of those of you who have been tuning in every single week, religiously, pun intended, my personal thanks. I hope you've enjoyed all the lectures. Uh, I've enjoyed putting them all together and we will be continuing. And in fact, um, on your screen is the picture of the next speaker. The next STEM lecture will be on July the 12th and our son Howard Karish will be presenting Tales from the Crypt where is the Aron? Should be very interesting. So um, unless we have something to schedule before then, hopefully I'll see you all on July 12th. And again, Dr. Gortz, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you who have tuned in and have a great week. Thank you, bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Alan or... Oh, he just logged out.